Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ABCs of AP, what is alkaline phosphatase and why is it important, um, webinar hosted by Softbones. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I know we're still missing some attendees, but we're going to go ahead for the sake of time, um, begin our webinar. Again, if you have any technical concerns, please feel free to private message me at the Global Genes host. You can also email me at Ashley Y, A-S-H-L-E-Y, -Y, at GoldGenes.org. Um, if you are joining us late into our webinar, it is being recorded and will be provided to SoftBones, and so you can go ahead and contact um, Denise Goodbar if you have questions regarding um, the PIPC recording. I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to Deb to get us started. Great, Slate. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Deborah C. and I'm the president and founder of SoftBones, and as many of you know, my son, Cannon, who's now 10, has hypophosphatasia, and also a carrier of HPP, as well as a caregiver. Uh, we know that education is a key part of our mission at SoftBones, and this webinar is just one way that we can reach patients around the world to educate them not only about hypophosphatase, but the role that alkalphosphatase, the enzyme, plays in our disease. Next slide. And this webinar would not be possible if it weren't for um, Ashley, who you just heard from, and our partnership with Global Genes. For those of you that don't know, Global Genes is one of the leading rare disease patient advocacy organizations in the world. As a profit organization promotes the needs of rare diseases in a unifying symbol of hope with their, their blue dem genes ribbon, as you can see here. And it's been a grassroots movement back in 2009, on the same time that we started Soft Bones, with just a few rare disease patient advocates and foundations, and it's one to over 500 global organizations. We're able to bring this webinar to you through the use of their technology and their support. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge them and say thank you for being a trusted partner. Do the Star Day show is no stranger to many of us. Michael White is a professor of medicine, pediatrics, and genetics at the Washington University School of Medicine and medical staff member of Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. He's also the medical scientific director of the Center for Metabolic Bone Disease and Molecular Research at the Shriners Hospital for Children in St. Louis. And of course, in his time, or what there is of it, he serves as the chairman of our SoftBones Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. White has authored hundreds of scientific papers, books concerning pediatric and adult metabolic bone diseases. He's involved in the research um, for some of the um, potential therapies to treat our diseases. Um, and at the end of his 20-minute presentation today, we've allotted two minutes for questions. So Dr. White can't answer any personal questions or offer medical advice so that you please keep your questions relevant to the subject of ALP within the context of this presentation. And with that, uh, Dr. White, thanks for joining us today and we hand it over to you to educate us on the ABCs of ALP. So to, um, I, if you have questions, we can go ahead and utilize the Q&A portion at the bottom of the screen. It's on the right-hand corner. Um, I will go ahead and filter those over to Dr. White at the end of this presentation. So I will go ahead and switch this over to Dr. White. Right, saying I'm grateful to uh, Deborah Sittick and uh, Denise uh, Goodbar and Global Genes for making this uh, webinar uh, possible. I've been asked to uh, talk about alkaline phosphatase, the enzyme that's deficient in hypophosphatasia, using lay language. So this is uh, to help especially patients uh, and their families uh, understand uh, what alkaline phosphatase is and, is and does. And uh, I alert you to, uh, let's see, I'm trying to change this slide. 
that um, just this month, April, uh, Jose Luis Mian and I, uh, Jose Luis at the Burnham, uh, Sanford Burnham Institute in San Diego and I published this uh, review in Calcified Tissue International of Alkaline Phosphatase and Hypophosphatasia. Uh, this is written in scientific language, so uh, if you want to share it with uh, a physician or a scientist, uh, by all means, it should be uh, Really uh, accessible to uh, all. So, an up to date uh, review of uh, uh, what we're talking about this afternoon. Uh, my university, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, uh, tells me to disclose to you that I have honoraria, I get travel reimbursement, and research grant support from Alexian Pharmaceuticals uh, there in Cheshire, Connecticut. And many of you know that. Uh, back in 2015, last year, asphatase alpha, which is also called zinc, approved in the United States, uh, the European Union, uh, Canada, Japan, uh, as a biologic for treating pediatric hypophosphatasia. The story of alkaline phosphatase uh, really begins uh, at the uh, start of the last century. Uh, this chemist, uh, Robert Robeson, uh, had finished uh, some work during World War I and uh, at the Lister Institute in London, England, turned to what was uh, a hot topic of that era. And that was how do we use uh, carbohydrates, sugars, uh, chemicals uh, to uh, have energy for metabolism, for our bodies uh, to function properly. And uh, in that era, uh, the chemists knew about uh, uh, the next slide, and that is phosphate. This is a phosphorus molecule hooked to oxygen and hydrogen. A formal name for it could be inorganic phosphate, uh, abbreviated PI. Chemists knew about uh, phosphate uh, back then. And they also knew that uh, phosphate uh, could be coupled to sugars. Uh, Robeson was interested to know how the sugars might be released, uh, uh, be free for energy metabolism, getting rid of the uh, phosphate here, and uh, studied uh, growing rats and rabbits uh, looking for some factor that released the phosphate uh, from the sugars. And when he looked in the bones and liver of these rats and rabbits, that's where this factor seemed to be especially rich. Uh, in the test tube, the phosphate would be released from the sugar, and uh, the sugar would be then free for energy metabolism. He was a wonderful chemist, and he realized that the release of phosphate might have significance beyond energy, energy metabolism and be relevant to bone mineralization. He knew uh, here that bone is like a living fiberglass. Um, we think sometimes of uh, bone uh, having a fiber. Uh, it's a protein called collagen, and that in good health, there's deposition of the glass, if you will. And this crystals of uh, calcium and phosphate combined. Um, and uh, Robeson and the chemists of that era knew that the amounts of both uh, calcium and phosphate had to be just right to have a strong, resilient uh, skeleton. In the 1923, uh, Robeson published this paper, and here he speculates, and I'll translate it from uh, sort of the medical language. He's talking about the possible significance. So maybe, sure hook to phosphate was important in ossification, in the formation of bones. Thing that um, with this factor that took the phosphate off the sugar was releasing what? Phosphate that was necessary to combine with calcium and therefore maybe put it into bones. So he uh, sort of went from uh, or continued interest in energy metabolism, but now was on to the notion that uh, there was something in bone and liver that could promote neutralization of the skeleton. 
skeleton. And uh, you could consider this or call this Robeson's uh, enzyme. But uh, alkaline phosphatase, so we like to abbreviate, abbreviate it as ALP. I say that this is an enzyme, so you say, uh, Dr. White, uh, what is an enzyme? Uh, you keep saying that, but uh, tell us more about uh, what enzymes are and do. And I say to you, an enzyme is a protein that does what? That breaks down certain sort of target chemicals. Uh, so it's a catalyst in a way. It's a protein. Its job is to break down certain specific chemicals. Uh, it depends on which enzyme you're dealing with as to which chemicals are going to be broken down. But these are then called substrates. So they're the targets of an enzyme. And we now know that uh, hypophosphatasia, is HPP, is caused by low levels of the enzyme alkaline phosphatase, uh, something that's going to break down other chemicals. And um, the concept of enzymes might be uh, most familiar to you if you're doing the wash. Uh, here is a detergent, and some of these detergents contain enzymes uh, in the powder that you put into the wash water. And uh, here is an enzyme, and this particular enzyme has the job of breaking down uh, fat stains, blood stains, uh, grease or grit, because it uh, acts by binding to uh, the blood stain or the grease or the grit and uh, somehow breaks the bond or uh, breaks up uh, the substrate, releases it, so it's small. Now it goes into the wash water and rinse. But a nice example of uh, one or a combination of different uh, enzymes and they, how they work, uh, let's say, wash water. But uh, in all of us, we have hundreds and hundreds of enzymes uh, in ourselves that are also regulating uh, chemical levels. So, uh, yes, an enzyme is a protein that breaks uh, down these substrates and hypophosphatasia is specifically due to deficiency of enzyme alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase assays, going all the way back to uh, Rosen's day, um, could be adapted to looking at uh, blood samples. You get a, a tube of blood, you would spin it, there would be serum or plasma, you could take that off. You could put it into a so-called bar, and using substances uh, that turn color broken down, uh, you could measure the amount of color that would be formed, and if you use specific substrates for alkaline phosphatase, the more the activity, the more the alkaline phosphatase, the more the color was released. So now you could measure it not only in his laboratory, but you can measure it in clinical laboratories using blood in case it uh, had some clinical usefulness. Interest. Um, Robeson found that this enzyme assay worked uh, best at so-called alkaline pH in his laboratory. So what al alkaline? You know that there are acidic things, acid. There are alkaline things, alkalinity. And here, uh, pure water has a pH of 7. That's neutral. But you become more acid as you go to saliva. Uh, to black coffee, bitter tasting tomatoes, vinegar, stomach acid or lemon juice, and then even hydrochloric acid. This is the acid side of uh, page. And you could go in the opposite direction. You could go uh, alkaline. Seaware has a slightly higher pH, baking soda even more, household ammonia, very high pH, bleach, oven cleaner. And then lye, or sodium hydroxide, has a very high alkaline pH. So Robeson was testing those uh, color-generating uh, compound substrates. He found that this reaction uh, worked best in the test tube in his laboratory when he was working at alkaline pHs in the buffer. That's where the word alkaline phosphatase comes from. Phosphatase just means 
it breaks off phosphate, and alkaline says it does it at alkaline pH. So we uh, assay blood alkaline phosphate taste levels. Actually, we're not measuring the protein, but we're measuring how well the alkaline phosphate taste hydrolyzes or takes off the phosphate group, and then comes uh, colorful in the test tube that measure it of its activity. Well, chemists, uh, ever since about the 1930s, recognized that doing this assay in a clinical laboratory hospital has importance. Why? Because high alkaline phosphatase levels in blood warn physicians about the possible presence of bone or lurk or biliary disease. Biliary disease would be something wrong, let's say, with the gallbladder. So that's why when you go to the doctor and you get a uh, comprehensive panel drawn, there's always alkaline phosphatase in it. It may be the most frequently uh, uh, assayed enzyme ever. And the docs are looking for high levels to make sure uh, you uh, or looking at high levels, hopefully finding normal levels to make sure that you don't have problems here. But recently, um, Maybe it's because of the increasing interest in hypophosphatase. Until recently, physicians in laboratories didn't pay much attention to low alkaline phosphatase levels. Um, they weren't indicating this. Um, we knew of some associated disorders. I'll show you them. But a low alkaline phosphatase wasn't nearly as startling to clinicians as a high level. And over the years, uh, there were causes of low alkaline phosphatase levels identified in serum. And it's called hypophospha, and it's almost hypophosphatasia, but it's hypophosphatasemia. All this means is that there are low levels of phosphatase in the blood. Uh, so that uh, not everything that causes low serum alkaline phosphatase is hypophosphatasia, uh, certainly one of them. But people have uh, studied families, and uh, there would be some low alkaline phosphatases going from generation to generation or in siblings. And they would say, uh, maybe this is familial, benign, not associated with disease. Or low levels could occur with uh, profound low blood counts, anemia, uh, scurvy, uh, severe forms at birth of osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, multiple myeloma, a variety of other diseases, usually very severe conditions that uh, physicians should recognize pretty, pretty easily. Uh, these are associated with low levels of serum alkaline phosphatase. So, so everything that's a low alkaline phosphatase is necessarily hypophosphatasia. Robeson, he continues his work from 1923 to 1932. Then he goes to New York University and he delivers an important speech uh, uh, summarizing the significance of phosphate when it combines with other chemicals, its role in metabolism. And uh, in that uh, publication, he made a very important uh, point uh, toward the end, and he says that, yes, back in 1923, we thought that releasing phosphate from sugars might be providing some of the phosphate necessarily to form bone, but Robin thought there's actually a second mechanism. Something else is controlling the position of bone salt. Uh, he didn't know what it was, but this is going to be a major factor in uh, what causes the problems in hypophosphatasia. Uh, Robeson knew that the alkaline pH uh, was not physiologic. None of us ever has a pH uh, that's so high to resemble what was in his test tube. He never used the expression alkaline phosphatase, but instead, quite rightfully, we'll call this bone phosphatase was the chemists later on in the clinical laboratories who were using the alkaline pH that then started alkaline phosphatase, and that is stuck, and I think it'll be with us forever. We're always going to be talking about alkaline phosphatase. So the chemists keep working, and what do they find? In human beings, they find that there are um, 
three uh, forms of alkaline phosphatase. I have to back up. I don't think this is working quite properly. There are forms of alkaline phosphatase that are specific to tissues. Uh, uh, one is found only in the placenta, one in the intestine, one in the ovaries or testes called tissue-specific because they're only found here, three different alkaline phosphatases. The fourth one in humans is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And this is the one that you find in bone and in liver. And for we call this tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. It's everywhere. And uh, I like to call it TNSALP. That's the abbreviation for tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. 1979, uh, this book was published. It talked about how you can measure it, what substrates to use, what animals have it, how you could separate the one in placenta from the intestine, and many, many things like that. But this 1,000-page book contained only 30 pages, 3%, that speculated back in 1979 as to what alkaline phosphatase really does. So back then, we didn't know too much about what those four types of alkaline phosphatase were really doing. There was progress. Back in the 1950s, uh, chemists had identified this, phosphoethanolamine, PEA, in urine of patients with phosphatase. In the 1980s, we found that the most prevalent form of vitamin uh, B6 in the circulation, pyridoxal phosphate, or PLP, uh, elevated in hypophosphatasia, and importantly, chemists uh, had identified in the 1960s that inorganic pyrophosphate, pyro means heat, if it's phosphate, and uh, you'll combine two phosphate molecules to form inorganic pyrophosphate, PPI, this was present at high levels in the blood and urine of individuals uh, with hypophosphatasia, and you look at these molecules, and it's not allowing me to do that. Phosphate, here's the phosphate, here are two phosphates. And what alkaline phosphatase is doing is it's clearing off these phosphates. So these are the natural substrates being broken down by TNS ALP. Where does uh, pyrophosphate come from? Well, uh, this cartoon, if it was working, would show you that ATP, a high-energy phosphate compound, uh, is broken down by another enzyme, PC1, on the surface of cells, and the pyrophosphate comes out and goes into a pool. There's also a channel that kind of spits out pyrophosphate from inside cells, putting it into a pool. And that's the job of tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase to break down the pyrophosphate, two phosphates, into single phosphates, providing it for skeletal mineralization, formation of bone crystals, etc. So this thing in hypophosphatasia, an active alkaline phosphatase, this is going to build up. Uh, will that be a problem, having too much pyrophosphate? Yeah, that's going to be the major biochemical problem in hypophosphatasia or HPP. I'm going to change slides. Bear with me. I consider inorganic pyrophosphate the villain, uh, the chemical that builds up in hypophosphatasia, and we need to get it down into normal levels. Uh, to uh, treat the disease. So in, in hypophosphatasia, I consider it, uh, the buildup in the body of inorganic pyrophosphate, PPI. Why, why is this a villain? Because PPI is a potent inhibitor. It blocks minerals like calcium and phosphorus from going into bones and teeth. If the PPI levels are high because the alkaline phosphatase activity is low, you're not going to mineralize your skeleton or teeth uh, properly. And what happens is, if you look with an electron microscope at the very first the beginnings of uh, mineralization in a healthy person, these little tiny matrix vesicles and inside form hydroxyapatite crystals from calcium and phosphorus. And these crystals grow, getting ready to be put into the fiber, the collagen, uh, grow until they rupture this vesicle, 
and then they grow some more. There should be more calcium and phosphorus, bigger, bigger crystal into the bones, healthy bones. But <clears throat> in phosphatasia, the organic pyrophosphate is sitting there in the bloodstream and outside the cells, and it blocks these crystals from growing. So this is the problem, too much inorganic pyrophosphate sitting there, being the skeleton and teeth from mineralizing. And how does this translate clinically? It translates to rickets. So instead of a nice, beautiful uh, conversion of cartilage to bone uh, in children, there are these tongues of radiolucency. Uh, there could be widening of growth plates. So you could see on an X-ray, uh, soft bones. Uh, that's where uh, the foundation name uh, uh, comes from, and what it tries to capture uh, bones, rickets, uh, osteomalacia when it occurs in an adult, and then child. The teeth are especially sensitive to the low alkaline phosphatase and the elevated pyrophosphate. And instead of uh, the baby teeth being shed normally, where the bone chewing cells uh, or chewing cells cut off the root and the child takes the tooth out at six. What's happened, hypophosphatasia, the patients get scared or the parents because the whole tooth slides out uh, uh, bloodlessly, painlessly, root intact. Why? Because there's no mineral on the surface of the tooth root and out it comes. So this is a very sensitive uh, area of uh, the teeth uh, the dentition of children with hypophosphatasia. And there's a form of odontohypophosphatasia. It's probably the most common form of hypophosphatasia where only the teeth but not the bones are affected. So why are blood and tissue alkaline phosphatase levels low in hypophosphatasia? So what's gone wrong? Why is the alkaline phosphatase not working? Well, uh, from our mother and from our father, we get uh, a copy of the gene that makes tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, and they're inheriting from a mom or dad one defective copy, or perhaps clinically worse, two defective copies, one from mom and dad, uh, of the gene that encodes, makes tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, then it's not going to work. It's defective. The pyrophate levels will build up as the cause of hypophosphatasia which is a heritable, a genetically based uh, disorder. So in your DNA um, is the uh, cookbook sequence of nucleotides that uh, are encoding many things, perhaps 12,000 genes. Uh, the gene for tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase is only one of them. The coding should be perfect in order for the DNA to talk about how amino acid chain that is the alkaline phosphatase should be put together and folded to make a nice happy alkaline phosphatase out here and have a mutation, a defect uh, of the gene that's making alkaline phosphatase, then this sequence is imperfect, uh, folding is uh, improper, and the alkaline phosphatase is not going to uh, work. And there are many ways that the uh, alkaline phosphatase molecule can be adversely affected. This is what it looks like under um, uh, sort of an electron microscope crystallography. It almost looks like a bat with head and wings. But two molecules uh, of alkaline phosphatase come together. Each one has a site where uh, it can remove phosphate from these various compounds, break up pyrophosphate. But this has to be just perfect in terms of its amino acid sequence. The two, uh, iso and the two um, uh, dimers have to come together perfectly for all of this to work. It has to hook to the surface of cells. Anything that's disrupting uh, the homodimer, the alkaline phosphatase, the mature enzyme, can lead to uh, deficient activity. And I, uh, how can we explain the remarkably broad-ranging severity of hypophosphatasia? We now know from study of hypophosphatasia patients throughout the world that there are 300 or more mu specific mutations in uh, the alkaline phosphatase gene that will lead to uh, a defective uh, 
um, the monomer of uh, the alkaline phosphatase uh, enzyme. And you can inherit uh, one effective uh, copy of uh, the gene and the alkaline phosphatase from mom or dad, and that's uh, likely to, more likely to give you mild disease. Or you can get a defective uh, copy of the gene from mom and dad, so you've got uh, no alkaline phosphatase that's working perfectly. And it's the many, many different mutations uh, and uh, inheriting one at a time or two at a time that account for the broad-ranging severity of hypophosphatasia. So how do you, can you see this in how we measure alkaline phosphatase in the clinical laboratory? It's a uh, normal distribution curve. We drew blood from 1,000 people, healthy people. Everybody has a perfectly average alkaline phosphatase. Uh, they're all healthy, but some have high levels, some have lowish levels compared to the average. And 68% are going to be around here but 95% are going to be here and here. So this is how statisticians define a normal range, but if you're over here, does that mean it's low? Does that mean you have hypophosphatasia? No, not necessarily. This is actually uh, uh, just a little bit lower than the normal range, uh, but 2% uh, of people walking around are going to be here and not necessarily with disease, and 2 First, we'll have a slightly elevated level compared to this normal range, but that doesn't mean they have bone, liver disease. So in the chemistry laboratory, defining a normal range uh, is very important because, again, if it's uh, liver disease or bone disease and it's a high level, it's going to be somewhere out here or here. And if hypophosphatasia, I'll show you, it's not going to necessarily be there, but it's going to be down here in general. So, you know, we got uh, uh, blood from patients with different forms of hypophosphatasia. It's a special scale, and these are healthy uh, kids. And you see 100 to about 350 is normal. 100 to 350. What does perinatal, the most uh, terrible hypophosphatasia, show you? A value of 4 or 12 but not 100 to 350. Infantile child, infantile hypophosphatasia might be a 10 or a 20, but certainly much lower than healthy kids. Childhood form, uh, severe forms within the childhood or mild forms, they're still low. Uh, they could be distinctly low. Here's a 40. That's much lower than 100 to 150. And in general, we think of uh, any patient with uh, hypophosphatasia, uh, <coughs> low serum and alkaline phosphatase activity. Here are adults. Here are healthy adults. And we look at uh, folks adults who have just tooth loss, so odonto hypophosphatasia, or some fracturing. They're clearly lower than the uh, peers. So these are uh, values that tend to reflect uh, the clinical severity hypophosphatasia, the classification of nosology. But all of this changes over time, and this is very important for all physicians to realize. Let's have this as their reference range for alkaline phosphatase. Uh, different assays could be used, so you have to know what normal range is for a particular laboratory, but in general, normal for an adult might be 3 to 120. And that's pretty steady during adult life. But when you get down to teenagers, they're growing rapidly. They uh, still have open growth plates. Their normal range for alkaline phosphatase is much higher than adults. Uh, young kids age five or six, they're clearly elevated compared to adults. They're healthy. And these newborns have very high levels uh, as well. Anybody who's looking at an alkaline phosphatase and interpreting it must know that this pattern exists in good health and to know uh, that children are usually much higher than adults. And this uh, normal range uh, is key. Uh, laboratories need to report it. Not all do. 
and get into trouble uh, where if you have a child with, a, with hypophosphatation, the value is over here. The laboratory is only reporting out the normal range for adults. Uh, this gets reported out as normal, but it's too low compared to children. So you can end up with a delayed diagnosis or a misdiagnosis on the la unless the laboratory is really giving you uh, almost year-by-year -year set of normal ranges. There's been good progress of that. Most laboratories are now doing this. And here's the uh, here's the reference range. And look, it's broken down to five, four-year-olds, five-year-old boys. And there's uh, a normal uh, range. But look at how different a four-year-old is compared to somebody 19 years old. And girls are a little bit different from boys over time. So Luckily now, using international units where the same assay is used, we have nice normal ranges to uh, use in diagnosing high or low alkaline phosphatase levels. In the last few slides, I could say that since 1979, nice progress in understanding mammalian in human alkaline phosphatases. This was published by Jose Luis Mian uh, from uh, Fred Burnham Institute against uh, San Diego in 2006. Um, you know that uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, has um, uh, been used or been approached to treat hypophosphatase over the years. In the 1980s, we gave plasma that was rich in alkaline phosphatase activity used it into babies with very severe hypophosphatasia, uh, fixed the bloodstream, but not the bones. Uh, we tried to give alkaline phosphatase rich cells by marrow cell transplantation. We increased the levels being made by the bone forming cells by using off label medicine for osteoporosis, uh, teriparatide, uh, with a little bit of success, but we. Uh, realized all along that the goal was to increase alkaline phosphatase levels in the skeleton itself. So then came uh, ENB0040. Eventually, this would be named asphatase alpha. And uh, this is uh, the treatment that you're probably hearing most about. Uh, this recombinant molecule, now that you could do things uh, with DNA, would combine two alkaline phosphatases down here way of uh, making the bone crystals take it up so that it's right in the skeleton or in the teeth where it needs to work. So, uh, this is uh, recent progress in understanding where and how alkaline phosphatase is working for mineralization of the skeleton and teeth. You're all interested, I believe, in hypophosphatasia and also alkaline phosphatase, and I could advertise that it also in this month's uh, of Nature Reviews Endocrinology, uh, I provide for physicians and maybe scientists an overview of phosphatase and alkaline phosphatase, cause of the disease, how we classify it, uh, the pyrophosphate as the villain that we need to lower the levels of, how we diagnose it, and how we treat it. And um, if you wish, Here's some contact information. Uh, happy to see uh, here in this hospital in uh, St. Louis, children with all forms of hypophosphatasia. Uh, we have an intensive care unit, so the prenatal and the very, very sick uh, infantile uh, patients uh, with hypophosphatasia tend to manage more locally, uh, but we the odonto and mild and severe childhood hypophosphatasia patients and those um, who have survived the uh, infantile form, uh, feel to contact me, and uh, I give credit to my home university and Shriners Hospital here in St. Louis. We'll end here and be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, so no questions have come up yet, but I'd like to open that to all the attendees listening today. If you guys have um, any questions for Dr. White that he can answer, please feel free to to utilize the Q&A portion at the bottom of your right-hand corner.
I had somebody asking to be reconnected. I don't know if I can kind of scroll to look for other questions. Oh. Ah, hang on. As I use this. Do you like white? Yeah, I think that would be easiest. Sure. Um, a question came in. How else is the body affected by lack of ALP besides bone and teeth issues? Very most severe forms, and this would be perinatal and uh, infantile hypophosphatasia. There could be such a profound deficiency of alkaline phosphatase activity that the um, metabolism of vitamin B6 is disturbed in such a way that uh, none of the buildup of the pyridoxal phosphate in the circulation that is broken down sufficiently to make pyridoxal. That's the form of vitamin B6 that can get into cells. So in its, uh, there's a tremendous extracellular buildup of PLP, but not enough for cells. And that could lead to a deficiency of neurotransmitter synthesis in the brain so that uh, very severely affected uh, infants and newborns have vitamin B6 dependent seizures. Uh, that's a hallmark uh, of uh, the biochemical disturbance and uh, has been a marker for uh, lethality. Uh, before the availability of enzyme replacement therapy, 18 patients who manifested uh, such seizures uh, went on to die from hypophosphatasia. Uh, a number of them who've had seizures are, are on clinical trials or being switched to uh, the commercial and strenzic and um, have survived uh, years uh, without the lethality of the vitamin B6 dependent seizures. There's also <coughs> Depending on the severity of hypophosphatasia, um, it's a weakness. And I think of it um, as uh, likely also uh, a result of the excess pyrophate levels outside the cells. The reason I say that is that there are similarities with some of the uh, drugs that we use for osteoporosis to pyrophosphate. And if you overdo it with those drugs, the weakness, the rickets and osteomalacia, uh, and an elevation in blood phosphate are characteristic of that uh, excess of uh, exposure to those agents mimicking hypophosphatasia. I think uh, last week at the Endocrine Society meeting in Boston, uh, Lucian investigators may have presented, I was there for the uh, presentation, but they may have uh, presented some evidence to support that notion. Um, so the next question is, what is patients with HPP? Form or prevalence uh, in the world. I, I would say that uh, the prevalence, by prevalence we mean uh, how many folks uh, are born with the disease or have the disease prevalence uh, in sense. It's clearly highest in uh, Mennonites in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, because the foundation, a founder mutation in that population, and it reappears and causes severe disease. Uh, it's also a so-called founder mutation in the Japanese, and when it reappears uh, as risk of inheritance, uh, inheriting one effective gene copy from mom and dad, it also causes severe disease. But in many of the places um, um, where uh, you're encountering either single mutations or combinations of different uh, tissue nonspecific mutations, um, and that uh, explains the great broad ranging severity. The uh, Prevalence uh, of hypophosphatasia severe in the Mennonites was estimated to be about one in every 2,500 newborns. In Tonto, it was uh, thought to be less, but about one per 100,000. 
In Europe, it was uh, approximated to be about one per 300,000. In Europe, uh, the estimation for a really severe disease uh, was that it was occurring in about, I think it was about one in 6,000 individuals. Uh, so it varies from place to place, um, and it uh, varies in severity. Uh, I think worldwide, in, in our experience, my experience, the most the most common form is odontohypophosphatasia. This is a mild one with tooth loss only, and uh, it's caused having one defective allele, one defective copy of the gene, enough to give you tooth problems uh, that could go from generation to generation, where severe diseases, uh, disease, infantile or perinatal is combining two, uh, so that's a less likely occurrence, and that's why those forms are rarer uh, than ontohypophosphatasia. If currently more adults are being identified versus pediatric population, is there a reason? I think uh, in part is uh, the explanation for that is uh, I just said it uh, generally takes uh, two defects coming together uh, to cause severe perinatal or infantile or severe childhood hypophosphatasia, whereas a single uh, defective to nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, it depends on the exact mutation, uh, but that's uh, the explanation uh, for the more mild forms that can be transmitted from generation to generation. So, Shriners, we might have a child who comes to us with odontal hypophosphatasia, but we're always very interested to explore whether or not grandpa, grandma, or great grandma, grandpa have any manifestations of the adult form of hypophosphatasia. It's um, the uh, common uh, presence of one defective allele that seems to explain why more mild forms are more common than the severe forms. Um, what makes the difference between HPP and hypophosphatemia? And, uh, it's medical language Hypophosphatemia means low phosphate. It's got low circulating levels of inorganic phosphate PI. And it can certainly give you uh, rickets or osteomalacia, XLH, uh, tumor induced rickets or osteomalacia. Other disorders uh, have as a major pathogenetic causal uh, problem. Uh, phosphate wasting so that the inorganic phosphate, the PI levels, drop in blood so that you've got maybe a normal amount of calcium, but you don't have a phosphate in the blood to mineralize your bones. So that's hypophosphatemia, low blood phosphate. The word for low blood alkaline phosphatase is similar. That's hypophosphatasemia, and that could be very uh, confusing and importantly confusing. So those words try to separate the two. Uh, with hypophosphatasia, you get uh, rickets or osteomalacia, even though the bloodstream has normal amounts of calcium and phosphate, where in hypophosphatemia, the phosphate is too low, and that's how you can end up with rickets or osteomalacia. Um, it looks like there's a lot of online references that list average ALP levels by age, and they vary widely. Is for a resource? I, I think uh, um, these laboratories uh, are using standardized instruments, uh, uh, standardized assay uh, approaches. So, uh, but also um, with each um, establishment of an instrument and uh, bringing on board an assay. Uh, they're referring back to uh, literature of their own experience to create normal ranges. So it isn't terribly surprising that uh, the normal ranges can differ from a commercial laboratory to another or a hospital-based laboratory.
Are patients with OI with Strenvik? No, to see uh, rational for uh, rationale for it um, in osteogenesis imperfecta. Most uh, patients have a defect in what the collagen, the fiber part uh, of uh, bone, and that would not be fixed by alkaline phosphatase uh, replacement. What IPLP do in adults? Does the brain in the same way as in infants? About IPLP, um, it seems to be an accumulation that uh, doesn't have uh, consequence. In fact, we sometimes give vitamin B6 to uh, study or carriers of hypophosphatasia to see just how high the level goes. It doesn't uh, seem to have any ill effect effect comes in the very severe patients which can't break down any of the PLP to PL. It's the PL that gets inside the cells so that if you have a complete breakdown of uh, hydrolysis of PLP to PL, then you could get seizures. So it's a deficiency of PL, not the buildup of PLP that we think is uh, trouble. In adults, with more mild hypophosphatasia than in natal or infantile cases, we think the PLP levels is distinctly elevated, but they don't go as high as in the uh, very ill uh, babies or newborns. Perfect. We'll go ahead and do just one more question, um, and then I'm going to go ahead and copy all of these questions and pass them over to Dr. White and Denise, and they will be able to contact everyone. So if we didn't get to your question, um, hopefully Dr. White or Denise will be able to email you guys all personally and let you guys know the answers to many of the questions you have. Um, some are a little bit more general as well as some specific. So we will make sure we get all those questions to Dr. White so he can answer for everybody. Um, so final question, uh, what about for adults? Other than bone and teeth issues, how does lack of ALP affect the adult body? Other than bones and teeth, um, well, with the, um, the dental uh, manifestations of hypophosphatasia in adults, uh, that uh, is an area that needs study. I know that the children lose teeth because they don't have mineralized cementum, they slide out. But it seems clear that uh, adults uh, with hypophosphatasia um, can have dental issues. Uh, it may be somewhat akin to what happens in some baby teeth where maybe the enamel isn't quite as strong or the dentin doesn't form perfectly. Uh, there's need for a considerable amount of research on adult teeth uh, in hypophosphatasia. Of course, there's need for research uh, for the pediatric uh, dentition as well. So uh, there's that poorly understood problem. Uh, I see most of the complications uh, of adult hypophosphatasia being attributable to underlying uh, um, the malacia or adult rickets. You could have fracturing, microfracturing, some deformity, achy bones. Uh, so those complications um, are directly attributable to uh, the malacia. Understandable how with um, the B uh, from fracturing, from achiness. Uh, you could have muscle weakness problems like that, whether or not the weakness is akin to well, the muscle weakness that you see prevalent in children. Uh, that uh, will need uh, more study. In adults, it's very interesting that in contrast to children, the long-standing elevation in pyrophosphate outside of cells in the blood can lead to various types of arthropathy, arthritis. And um, patients, adult patients with hypophosphatasia can have uh, um, pyrophosphate arthropathy. Uh, they can have joint uh, difficulties, uh, bone destruction within joints. 
somehow attributable perhaps to the accumulation of crystals of inorganic pyrophosphate. Some of these patients have pseudo-gout. It resembles the gout of uric acid accumulation, but here the culprit, once again, is accumulation of pyrophosphate in joints, pseudo-gout. And then there's a um, not terribly well understood uh, problem of calcific periarthritis where it's paradoxical that around shoulders or elbows uh, or hips, there can be depositing, a depositing of hydroxyapatite crystals, not where it should be inside bone, but around joints. Um, there's that, uh, calcific periarthritis. Pyrophosphate can combine with calcium and calcified discs, uh, vertebral discs, be predisposing to disc degeneration. And then also poorly understood, sometimes tendons and ligaments suffice when they shouldn't be. Um, so here you have a a problem where your bones aren't mineralizing properly, but ligaments and tendons. Uh, joint capsules are uh, calcifying excessively. So those are complications that uh, the adults see that the children don't. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, again, we are coming to the end of our webinar. If you guys have any further questions, I will leave the webinar open for a couple more minutes. Please feel free to um, type in your questions, and I will be getting all of those questions to Denise and Dr. White. He answered offline. So to um, close us up for today, I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to Denise. Good evening. This is Denise Goodbar, and I'm the program manager for Softbones. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of speaking with, first of all, I wanted to give a big thank you to Dr. White for providing us with such a worthwhile presentation. Um, I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure you all would concur. I would also like to take the time to thank Global Genes for providing the technical support. We certainly couldn't have done that without you. Um, as the Softbones Foundation and community, we're very lucky to be able to provide you with programming like this and hope to continue to be able to provide you with worthwhile uh, webinars like this going forward. Um, Ashley said, please feel free to email me any additional questions that you might have at denise at softbones.org and I'll be happy to coordinate with Dr. White. So please reach out to me, not to Dr. White, um, directly, and um, I will be happy to compile the questions and answers in order to get you that information. Again, thank you so much again to all of you for participating, um, and look forward to future uh, worthwhile events.